Hey, welcome everybody to another episode of Grow Yourself from the Inside Out. You know, today we're going to talk about a subject that probably, if you haven't talked about it a lot, you've experienced it a lot. And, um, and it has to do with failure. In fact, if you ask successful people about their failures, uh, you will find that most have made some major blunders, you know, on their road to success. But here's the thing, and here's the key. You know, these people, they learn from their mistakes, but not necessarily without pain. In fact, failure can be pretty harsh. It even can be traumatizing, but not necessarily, uh, you know, overwhelming. And I'll tell you about that in just a moment. Um, so here's another key. If you're looking to achieve success, you must learn to manage your failure. Here's another key. Failure can be a hard pill to swallow, but for successful people, the word failure actually has a different meaning. You think about Thomas Edison, and you've all heard this a million times. He said, I have not failed. I've just found 10,000 ways that won't work. You see, often people use this as a stepping stone to overcome their challenges and to achieve success. In fact, in the face of failure, many give up on their dreams. Some deal with the, the failure and learn and go on to achieve great things. So here's the big question. How do you deal with failure? How does one manage failure? Well, that's what my guest here, Andrew Thorpe King, is going to talk about. Andrew is an executive uh, fin bank, fintech banger. I, I don't know if I actually have that word right. Fintech, fintech banker. He's a spy novelist. He's a speaker. He's a punk rocker. He's a podcaster. He's an ex bodybuilder, cigar lover, and serial entrepreneur. And you can hear in just that phrase alone, he's probably experienced a little bit of failure. Uh, but we'll talk about that more in just a second. He founded two independent record labels, Thorpe Records and Sailor's Grave Records, and has invested in many spaces, including online lending, fitness, lead generation, and independent music. Andrew Thorpe King is, a, is also, here you go, a serial failure. He has crashed and burned through bankruptcy, divorce, mortgage, default, you know, public assistance, and multiple business failures. But like a jack-in-the-box, after a punch, he pops back up every time, rebuilding his life, informed by failure, with a big smile on his face. So Andrew wrote a book called Failure Rules, The Five Rules to Failure for Entrepreneurs, Creatives, and Authentics, which I'm going to ask him about that. You know, ladies and gentlemen, would you please welcome my guest, Andrew Thorpe King. Andrew, wow, thank you so much for joining us. It's really great to have you on Grow Yourself. It's great to be here, Kevin. Glad to finally uh, get into this conversation with you. Likewise. You know, uh, I think a lot of people are attracted to this. Uh, failure, you know, I, I mean, I don't even know where to start when I talk about the failures in my life, but I think what you have done is you have nailed this concept from the standpoint of, you know, what you actually do about failure. And so I want to ask you that. But the first thing I want to ask you uh, about your book, because it was the first thing that actually caught my eyes, is you said that, um, you said that, you know, the five rules of failure for entrepreneurs, creatives, and authentics. What do you mean by authentics? So that's a great question. And I, I think I may have invented the word in this context as a noun, but okay. it, I was struggling with the subtitle. Obviously, authors go through various, you know, uh, oh, yeah. subtitle, working subtitles and working titles. And I had a bunch of them laid out and I was like, who is this book exactly for? So Entrepreneurs was very, very clear. Creatives certainly began, became clear as I started laying out the book and, yeah. and choosing certain case studies because it was also just it was about the artist, too. Not just the entrepreneur, but the solopreneur artist uh, about being also an entre employee within a corporate context. Entrepreneur is very, very broad uh, within the book. It's more about a, a ownership mindset and not uh, measurable um, uh, ownership uh, from an equity standpoint. Right. So it's more about yes. a mindset. Yes. And so that's how I approach the word entrepreneur in here, leaving your imprint wherever you go and, and uh, whatever you're doing, whatever pursuit you are involved in, owning it as if it's your own uh to to take hold of and then so entrepreneurs creatives those two fell pretty quickly into the subtitle and made sense and then authentics you know i thought about all the different case studies that um that i included in the book I thought about my own life and my own journey to interpret what it means to be my authentic self 
All right. And, um, you know, I have a variety of case studies in the book. I mean, everybody from, um, you know, um, corporate tech misfits, Shonibus Rao, who's a podcaster, author of the art of uh, being unmistakable to Winston Churchill, to Mm. punk rock icon, Henry Rollins, to spy novelist, Vince Flynn, to uh, 10 pin bowler, Thomas Smallwood, just a wide variety of case studies. And I looked at all of them and what was the thing that pulled them into a unique calling journey where they could have decided to mute their internal spirit voice, to not follow the path that was beckoning them. And to me, it was this mark of authenticity that at every touch point along their path, when circumstances um, you know, converged to show a path that would bring them into an authentic joining of, of their of their unique calling journey that maximized their unique output in the world, that leveraged their unique talent stack. At every one of those touch points, it seemed to me that they were looking to marry their life with a sense of authenticity wow. and that to not follow the, those the, you know those openings in their path. Yeah even if they were harder, even if they were messy, even if they're unsafe, which often they are when you're joining your authentic self with your your calling journey, they they chose that as opposed to being somewhat inauthentic. Now, that said, I still have a definition of terms in the book for the word authentic. Yeah. And I describe it as a spectrum because our our authentic self is evolving. I do a video on this too on my YouTube channel at Andrew Thorpe King, no no E on the end of Thorpe, T-H-O-R-P. And it's the idea of, uh, you know, as we stretch ourselves, as we, as we take on new modes of being, as we're confronted with growth in the world, we do actually expand and change what our authentic self is, but we still need to interpret it. And there are touch, there are kind of um, opportunities in life where we might have the discernment to say, I'm not going to go in this direction or pursue this pursuit because it really is not in alignment with what I believe is the maximum use of my unique talent stack. And it will not join me with my calling journey. And therefore it's not authentic. And if I go that route, I won't be authentic. Wow. So authentic is really kind of defining a constant marrying of your uh, unique talent stack used in the world to, uh, join yourself with your calling journey and if you're out of alignment with that chances are you're diminished in your authenticity and that that that's kind of the way i describe it wow i love that you know and and the other part that i i think is in line with what you're saying here is that uh you know when you fail uh again assuming uh the type of person you are i guess uh when you fail it humbles you and humility will bring around some authenticity won't it Absolutely. I mean, one of the things I talk about in the book is I experienced, you know, a sequence of cascading failures of various degrees, many of them seemingly near catastrophic. Obviously, they weren't because here I am stronger than ever. But throughout my 20s and my 30s, right, that was kind of the story of my life then. And, And one of the things I say in the book is that, you know, although failure is something you want to avoid, it's something you want to prepare for when it's unavoidable. Yeah. And figure out in a premeditative fashion how you're going to metabolize it, leverage it to become stronger, essentially like the Hydra, gaining from harm, like Nassim Tlaib says in his book, Anti-Fragile. So that's how you want to have this premeditative mindset towards failure. Um, you know, at the same time, when you do uh, experience certain failures and you get broken um, and you become stronger at the broken places, the way Hemingway wrote about, you do have a sensitivity in your soul. Uh, for me, it allowed me to have a greater um, stretching of my empathy muscle uh, as I move forward into life to view others who are struggling or experiencing failures with a lot more empathy. And so I think it sharpens your humility, your discernment, your empathy, and your ability to really embrace any future success that manifests with a deeper sense of gratitude and just appreciation <laughs> of, um, you know, even the the, the, the the providence that might be undergirding and underpinning uh, such successes and such lessons that you learn along the way. Brother, all I can say is preach it, man. I mean, you're, you're laying this out in quite a fashion here. So let me back up just a, set, a second. I, I have a lot of questions for you. We probably won't get them all in, but maybe we'll do a second interview and get them in. But here's my first question. If you know, if you it, it's quite a read. I did. I did read a, a good amount of your book and it, it's just fascinating. I highly recommend it to those out there who want to learn how to succeed 
by way of failure. And by the way, I would emphasize, you're not saying go out and fail so that you could succeed. It's just no. inherent or, you know, intrinsic in the process, I would submit to you. But let me ask you this, if you were to just sum up your book in a phrase, in a, a short phrase, a short paragraph, you know, what would you say, Andrew, is the big takeaway? I think the big takeaway is really encapsulated in, I think, the most powerful rule, the five rules of failure. And again, the book is for your audience. It's, it's failure rules. Turn around the a little five bit more so people can see it. Yep, there it is. Beautiful. Nice. Failure yep. rules, with exclamation mark, kind of a, a fist in the air uh, proclamation. Uh, the five rules of failure for entrepreneurs, creatives, and authentics. So uh, as I began laying out my own stories of failure, and step back and, and let the writing rest and then looked at it, it became clear that, okay, there's some lessons embedded in here. Those lessons ended up being grouped up and bunched up uh, to roll up into what became uh, clear uh, as, as five distilled rules. Uh, and so rule number five is you are not your failures. Oh man! So I think that's at the heart of the book. And, and maybe that's why it's the last one, because that's the conclusion is, you know, you are not your failures detached from the optics of failure. So I would say that's really the key message of the book. It all rolls up to number five, which is you got to separate yourself, your identity from your failures. Does not mean that you might not have consequences, messiness, uh, real struggles to deal with your failures. It doesn't mean that you won't have to discard old thinking so that you can take on new layers of thinking within your failures. But at the end of the day, you know, I think so many people tie their identity to their failures. And I think society as a whole uh, maybe less now than than before, um, you know, really measures us against these preconceived notions of, of a linear life, of linear thinking, and, um, you know, frowns upon certain failures, uh, as opposed to seeing them as part of the journey, particularly for those that are living nonlinear lives, that are, that are chasing after unorthodox career paths, or that are trying to pursue the highest meaning in their life, which ultimately involves for most people, a lot more risk because I think I think actions of of audacity uh, to pursue highest meaning usually travel together with failures. They go hand in hand, and you have wow. to prepare to tackle one in order to achieve the other. Wow, that's fascinating. Um, I, I want to ask you the following: You know, is failure is failure merely a perception? Well, I think that's a good question. It does matter. It does depend on how you're framing the pursuit, right? Like you gave the Edison example. He never failed in his mind because the goal or the idea was never some presumption that he was going to succeed at XYZ. It was all an experiment. And I think that's true to a certain degree for a lot of things. And it is good to go into certain pursuits with that mindset to know I'm going to try this out. Here's the, the myriad possibilities that could occur. I am okay with the potential worst case, worst case possibilities. I've planned for that. I have a contingency. I've covered those risks. That's all prudent thinking. Uh, but I think at the same time, failures do exist and they are real. We live in a broken world. There right. is no such thing as, 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 as kind of a perfect path. Yes. And I, I really define failure very broadly in the book. It's not just you know a, 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 a derelict of decisioning for us individually. Yeah. That leads to failures. Uh, it, it's not just a gap in our, you know, due diligence. It's also just a mere participation in the human condition. The failures can occur around us and shroud us without us, you know, uh, ratifying them or uh, approving of them. I mean, you know, you think of J.R.R. Tolkien. I, I talk about Tolkien in the book. Mm -hmm. Obviously, wrote Lord of the Rings and uh, you know, the father of high fantasy and how it was him being extracted from the battlefield with an injury and dealing with a bout of trench fever. He's, he's huddled up in, in a cottage in, uh, in, uh, in England to kind of lick his wounds. And it was in that failure of sickness, of war, the experiential failure of participating in the human condition. It was in that empty space where it's, you know, he, he was kind of purified by that failure. And that's failure rule number one, failure purifies, the phoenix must burn to emerge. And Tolkien, that's when his literary fires really burned inside. That open space of failure is when he heard his internal spirit voice and finally, for the first time, diligently acted on those creative pulses within, in the valley of failure. And I think sometimes it's in the valley of failure when everything is disassembled that we can actually get rid of the waste that is accumulated around us and hear our internal spirit voice. That's another wow. term in the book, internal spirit voice, which yes. I kind of use very broadly as to describe 
that voice that I think that we all recognize within us, whether it's our conscience, our gut feeling, an intuition. It's described in different ways by different people, groups, and cultures, and religions, and, and non-faith Holy expressions. Spirit, yeah. For me, yeah. For me, I recognize it as God. Um, but I, but I, I think that that phrase kind of captures what we all as humans know when we yeah. say that voice inside. And we can mute that, we can muzzle that, we can reject that, or we can follow it. And following it is the difficult path and usually leads to, leads to highest meaning. Yeah. Now, here's a weird paradox in a sense. And I don't recall if I read about this in the book, but I think about somebody like like Van Gogh. Van Gogh might actually be one of the, in, in a quirky kind of way, and this is good, it's not going to sit well with, with these uh, people who love Van Gogh, and I'm one of them. But he killed himself because he believed he, saw, he was a failure. I mean, to me, that's almost the ultimate failure there is that he just thought he was a complete failure, killed himself. And then, you know, now, you know, what is his art worth? Hundreds of millions of dollars? Sure. I mean, you know what? Well, that's that's you are not your failures. Failure rule number five. If, if you invoke that, that, that might not happen, right? Right. That's right. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. So and and then Andrew and and we're trying to well let me know, let so, me just touch on that point please, for a second man, there too do it. thinking of the Van Gogh go analogy there or the example so he's killing himself because he hadn't seen uh, his his art really impact the world maybe the way that he thought so he interpreted that as failure he can't see through the arc of time in the way that 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 the you know the divine might uh, and mm. he did not he saw himself as his failures and he misinterpreted what his failures were. Um, and so I think of, that's another thing I talk about in the book is sometimes you can make good decisions and they're still good decisions, even if they don't le lead to linearly traceable good outcomes. Mm. And so you have to also detach sometimes from the outcome. Sometimes yeah. the outcome is feedback and will help you get better. But sometimes you really made the best decision with all the information you, you received and they don't tie directly to good outcomes. Um, so I think that's interesting in the case of uh, Van Gogh. Yeah, you know, and uh, of, of course, you know, anybody who, who doesn't know that, and I'm not an aficionado on Van Gogh, but uh, anybody who knows that would just shake their head, you know, that, that he, was, he was everything but a failure in, in this way. But now we're back to this idea of one's perception about it. And so, of course, so I think about failure in a number of ways. One, in, first of all, how you, and, and you talk about this, you, you have some great terms in your uh in your book about being what a failure prepper i love that book that's right and, and when i read that i just immediately got it you know that i think you said something about um you know uh, in, you know l learning to brace yourself for the impact you know that that's you're right. prepared yeah. for the failure so so on the one hand there's the your approach your mindset to failure right and then and, and this is not all inclusive obviously but then there's the other concept of how you respond or react to failure, right? Can you talk That's about right. those two ideas? I mean, you kind of talked about your, your maybe the approach to failure, but I'd love to just hear your thoughts about one, how people ought to approach failure. This is before the failure actually takes place, you right. see, right? And then, yeah. and then there's the other failure. And I'm kind of slicing and dicing here, perhaps uh, speak to a man who wrote a book on failure. It may not sit well with you. But, but I, again, I do think about the second part of it is that, okay, so you failed. Now what? What say you? Yeah, so there's a lot there. Um, so I think it's the premeditative approach to failure is what I learned mm. a little too late but not late enough, right? I think I, in my early entrepreneurial zeal, did not think through all the uh, potential outcomes of many of my, my entrepreneurial actions. And they led to certain failures that might've been preventable. Mm. Didn't mean that my actions are regrettable in the end because they all led to good things and I learned so much from it and it made me who I am today. But I think that is one of the things I learned that you need to anticipate it. You need to determine ahead of time how you're going to collide into it when it happens, you certainly want to try to avoid it when you can, but you have to understand that it is going to come again, particularly on certain nonlinear paths of, of, of creatives, of entrepreneurs. Um, and then when it does happen, it's a matter of stepping outside of it, detaching your identity from it, remembering that you, you need to anchor yourself to internal attachments and take a non-attachment approach 
mm. uh, to your failures, just like as, as you know, an for objective me, approach, I also take, yes. yeah, yeah. And just not attaching yourself to even, you know, maybe what might be a negative financial outcome or mm. a, um, a, a, a disruption in your, your life circumstances that might occur from a failure and kind of roll with that fluidity. Uh, and, um, you know, it, it really is, it's how you respond to it that matters. Um, and uh, being able to do it with a heart of gratitude, being able to have an open mind to see the changes that your failures force into your life as, as an opportunity, you know, leverage chaos as an opportunity, you know, as an opportunity, um, you know, engine. And, um, you know, I think that's, that's the way you need to respond. That's incredible. You know, Andrew, can you, would you just share with the audience a little bit about, you don't have to go through your whole life, but maybe some of the significant, uh, I don't know if I want to say significant failures because you, you write about them in the book. So you know, my life, tell me how you failed, you know, but maybe, maybe the ones that really, um, that really uh, marked your life, mostly from the lessons, you know, that you learned from them. Can you just share a little bit about your background and, and uh, how you ended up arriving at this book. It's a fascinating, uh, a fascinating set of ideas and, 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 and facts really. Yeah. So I, I mentioned uh, in my twenties and thirties, that's when I felt this cascading of failures. I got married really young um, and uh, didn't have much of a financial uh, foundation. And I had this entrepreneurial spirit um, I struggled with how to marry money and meaning in my life. Mm. Uh, you know, the practical uh, need to be nimble in the world and to make an income and then the, the personal spiritual need to have integrity with who I believe I was meant to be on this earth. Right. Trying to marry those two has always been a struggle for me. It's a big theme in the book. Um, and uh, early on in my life, I uh, decided after being laid off from a job, um, you know, young family. My, my son was born at that time. I decided to, to start my own record labels. Uh, and that has been, has been an amazing journey. I still uh, own the rights to over hundred recordings today, but there was wow. lots of ups and downs along the way. So, I mean, just to kind of laundry list the failures that have kind of informed this book and informed my mentality, uh, went through a bankruptcy, a personal bankruptcy in order to actually preserve, uh, you know, the, the record labels. I, I, at one point, uh, my financial planning practice, uh, was, was, was failing, uh, due to the 2008, uh, crisis and mm -hmm. some other, um, things. And I actually fell on public assistance. Uh, I, uh, my first marriage disintegrated after 14 years and there was no way to repair it. I was estranged from my fun son for, for, for several months at one period. And that was kind of this relational failure that really yeah. taught me a lot and put me through a lot of pain and informed how I yeah. move forward in my relationships now. Um, so, you know, it's things like that that really shaped, um, you know, the, the premise and, and the lessons that uh, are born in this book. And so where did what you know, what happened or where did you get to this point where you decided that you were going to write about, you know, failure, if you will, which in a lot of ways you're not writing about failure, but I get it. Yeah. You know, you're yes, really, you're right, right. right. It is all centered around the topic, but there's so much more in here that's yes. built around that idea. Um, so I was, uh, it was right when my, uh, I was going through a business divorce where at the time, one of my core incomes was uh, going away as a result of this business divorce. I had other income at the time, but I had to reshuffle everything and come up with a new plan and reinvent. Uh, and I was, uh, I knew at the time also that my divorce with my ex-wife was, was happening. It was going to go, it was going to, it was going to come forward. So it was amidst that tumult and that chaos. I was taking a, a walk on the beach and I was thinking through all the things that I had learned from all the things that happened to me. Oh wow! Uh, and my life had not really, it had not stabilized yet. You know, th mm. that didn't happen until much later till my forties and, you know, I'm almost 50 now. It's really only in this past decade where there's been this blossoming of, of, of stabilization and, and, and that prosperity, uh, both from a material standpoint and also from a, uh, fulfillment standpoint in terms of uh, finding my place in the world and really joining with my calling journey. Um, and I just, I was listening, I'm a punk rocker. So I'm listening to some of my favorite songs, Ace of Spades, My Motorhead, Hard Times by the Cro-Mags, the singer of the Cro-Mags, John Joseph is a triathlete, uh, author and, and uh, speaker. And he wrote the forward to this book, which I'm very grateful for. Mm -hmm. And those songs uh, really kind of amplified and echoed this feeling I had of, of who I was as an entrepreneur, 
willing to take the gamble and the risk, but also wanting to find the reward and find the balance and, and marrying maximum responsibility with maximum freedom, all of these kind of concepts and thinking through my experiences and also all the virtual mentors and uh, inspiration inputs that had gotten me through. So whether it's a book or whether it's a scripture or whether it's a song or mm. whatever it might be. And I was like, I need to, and I just felt this conviction like this. All right. I'm going to do a lot of things that just came out of this brainstorming session of this walk. A lot of, a, a lot of reorganizing, reorganizing in my life, repurposing different businesses, changing this, changing that. And I was convicted. I had to write a book on the value of failure. That was 2013. I wrote some rough notes down that blossom over the last seven, eight years to become this book as I diligently over time just began working on it and then building out even ideas to, to really repurpose that message into various formats and kind of build a business around it that I call the failure verse. That's, uh, you know, it's essentially launching now that the book is out, you know, you know, the, I mean, you just sort of in, in some ways defined, you know, what, what can happen with failure in that, you know, without those failures, I guess it goes without saying this book would have never happened and that would not happen. That's right. You know, and, and not, and not, not nearly as profoundly, you know, you could, you could, you could write about failure. You know, I could write a book about failure, Sure. but, but having not, you know, but experiencing the level of failure, and, and probably all of us can look back on our life and think about a variety of failures. And, you know, some are in fact, very traumatic. Yes. And they impact us in a lot of different ways, and and then and then that then that goes to the idea that, well, depending on how you approach failure, what your mindset before the failure takes place determines whether or not you are resilient, or mm -hmm. whether you kill yourself like Van Gogh did. You know? That's right. That's right. I mean, it, it. You know, but here's the thing. You know, so everybody's experienced failure. Um, there's a lot of different ways. I guess I could ask this, but. What qualifies as failure? You know, I mean, aren't there some things like even in a marriage? I mean, can't you just say it didn't work? I mean, is is that is that is that a failure? And by the way, is it your failure? Right. See, I, I mean, I, I we all know people who have divorced and we sure. know that divorce you talk about traumatic, you know, I mean, I've seen some traumatic, really just down and out, ugly, ugly divorces and uh, I think it can scar people for life. Yeah, I think you're right. And so I think it's subjective. And I think I, I hinted that in the book. Enough nuance in the book to leave room for the fact that your definition of failure can be very subjective. But I think we all know it when we feel it or we know it when we think we're going through it. And to the marital point, I think there is marriages that fail. And then there's also divorces that fail in that Okay, not only is your marriage disintegrating, but then you fail at the act of becoming divorced and you make it worse the divorce process. Yes, yes, um, yes, th yes. There was a bit of that in mine, and that was part of the failure wow. that I went through. Being yeah. blindsided by the fact that the divorce could even happen to me, I think made me approach the divorce in a way where there was just some added toxicity that didn't need to be there. Right. And, uh, you know, there was some culpability there on my part. So, you know, I think that was part of failure. Um, you know, part of the stew of that entire, you know, uh, piece of my, uh, history. Um, yeah. but I think you're right. It's very hard to define failure, but, but we kind of all know it when we touch it and even playing with the, the word play of failure in the book after it sucks, failure rules. I mean, a lot of it is kind of negating the idea of failure in some ways. Yeah. That it's not really failure. It's part of life. This is what you go through. Sometimes yeah. it's mistakes. So there's different ways to frame it. But I think just the, the word failure does really resonate with most people in terms of uh, a sensibility that they struggle with uh, throughout the ups and downs of life. Yeah, you know, and here's one of my, um, first of all, I, I think that, you know, there, there are some people that, and, and I think it's it's just sort of uh, it's just sort of banter or, or or you know just people just saying things to try to put some positivity in it. You know, I personally, you know, I don't think it's wrong to say that you failed about it. 
of something. I mean, you know, failure, I guess you could on the one hand say it's, it's a word and it's a definition, you know, there's a definition for it and I failed at it. The question becomes, again, what I kind of said earlier is, you know, what do you do about it? Where does your mind go? Do you fail? Do you fall into a hole and keep digging until yep. you are in hell, basically? That's right. Or do you, or do you, you know, you know, I was talking to my wife about this and she said, you know, I was just asking her just her general thoughts about failure. And she said, well, my first thought is failure is a very emotional word. Mm, that's right. You see? That's right. And, you know, and so when we speak of failure with that connotation, uh, somebody wants to jump up, and this was sort of my second point that I was getting to that I don't think is being allowed to happen enough by parents, is that because it's such an emotional word, because we believe that we shouldn't fail or that right. we don't want to see somebody hurt who who may fail, then That's right. parents don't allow their kids to fail. Yes. To with that. And I think that later part is very important. I think a lot of this has a lot to do with societal expectations or our perception of them, uh, family expectations or our perception, because we might not even be right in what we think our family expectations are mm -hmm. of us. And so I think when people feel as if they're not living up to other people's expectations, particularly people that are people pleasers, that failure compounds an emotional sense to them. And I think that's part of the reason I wrote the book is to give people some tools and some new ways of thinking about the, that emotional cyclone that might happen in those instances and to learn failure rule number five, you're not your failures and to learn how failure can rule in all these other ways. I mean, one of the quotes that really buoyed me, buoyed me forward uh, on that beach walk where I decided to write this book was Winston Churchill, success is uh, going from failure to failure with no loss of enthusiasm. And for me, it was like, yeah, that's me. I just keep going. Yeah. And it is that enthusiasm, which is the through line and the thread for every time I pick myself up and reinvent myself, because I always have enthusiasm for whatever the new reinvention scheme is. And to me, that I think that's really enthusiasm is a divine spirit spirit that helps us move forward. It's like Man. it's like an endorphin through pain, right? Uh, that helps you keep going. Um, and so to give an example, kind of the opposite okay. of that or, or partially the opposite of that. I write about uh, CA, CEO uh, or Silicon Valley investor and former CEO Kamal Ravikant in the book. He wrote a, he wrote a book called uh, Love Yourself uh, Like Your Life Depends On It. Oh, wow. uh, and he, yeah, his I'm story is this, he, yeah. he failed as a CEO uh, and he found a deep depression, was living off his credit cards, could barely crawl out of bed, ignored outreach from, fr from friends, was falling into the abyss, uh, and he was slipping. So that reaction is the opposite of enthusiasm, the opposite of moving forward, that's completely attaching your identity to your failure, allowing your physical health then to be also impacted by those emotions and your actions, right? That's slipping away. That's almost the Van Gelt go route. He then amidst that did pick himself up and, and, and learned how to embrace uh, essentially loving himself uh, yeah. and changing the, the loops in his head, the stories he was telling himself about himself. Oh, I uh, love that, man. And, and then from there, like you said, similar to my book, that had I not gone through these, this book wouldn't exist. Mm -hmm. He then wrote that book in that time period. And it was then that book that actually lifted him out of that situation. He only wrote an 8,000 word book, very short, sold it for $2.99, sold 500,000 copies, enough to get him out of the financial scenario he was in, all from his new way of framing his, uh, his self-perception. Uh, now he's a writer of many other books. He's an entrepreneur again. Like it's just totally, you know, it's the Phoenix burning from the flames, but he had a choice, right? He could have continued to slip into the abyss and embrace self-doubt, uh, and, um, you know, victimhood, the, the victimhood or just, or just the depression of, of the uh, emotional cyclone of, of yeah. failure and how that can really paralyze people. Yeah. I want to ask about this and I, I don't, you know, I mean, I guess I guess we could use this uh, victim mindset as a failure mindset. It is a concern of mine, to be honest with you. I see, uh, I you know, I read a fair amount, you know, online, particularly on on LinkedIn, and sometime within the last couple of years, and this is not a slam on LinkedIn, but 
it's almost turned into a venue to uh, to brag about your victimhood. I see it so much, and it's not just there. So again, I'm not slamming on LinkedIn. It's a, it's a great it's a great uh, forum in a lot of different ways, but I guess. Um, I, I'm particularly struck about it because it is a site for professional networking and these other sorts mm. of things. And but I'm all but you see it everywhere on social media. You see it. Uh, I, I recall maybe two or three, four years ago. I don't know. I uh, I was looking at um, having a conversation with somebody, and I went to her website and looked at her her bio, and it was about a two-page bio filled with all of her failures and, and how much victimhood she is, she had experienced mm -hmm. it almost as though this was a badge of honor, you right. know, and Hey, listen, you, yeah. uh, rags to riches. I'm all about it. You know, I mean, the, the, <laughs> these things happen, you know, but I guess, I, I guess just since you've uh, put so much work and study and research into the whole idea of failure, you know, what are your, what are your thoughts about this paradigm that people seem to be, uh, exacerbating really through this continually discussing mm -hmm. it, continually bringing up how much I've yep. failed and, and how, what a great, yeah. how big of a victim. It's like almost like this contest of who's the bigger victim. What are your thoughts about that, Andrew? I've kind so of unpack that a spot little. here. You yeah, know? no, that's fine. That's no, good stuff. So I would think, yeah, I think of that, you know, there, there, there's, there's two pieces to essentially all the failure stories I go, failure stories I go through. Yeah. You know, again, the tagline of the book is after it sucks, failure rules. 100%. I don't stop it after it sucks. It, I don't stop at the suck part. That's exactly right. You have right. to find a way to make them rule. That's yeah. the whole point of the book. If you're stuck in the suck part and then you're soliciting and, and looking for others to blame externally yes. and you're in that victimhood mentality, you will stay there. There's really no nobility, no virtue in that, right? If you're only looking for empathy uh, from others for the pain you're going through in the suck part, you're only getting halfway there. That can be useful, but only if it's a springboard to victory. You need wow. to have the springboard to victory. How are you gonna do that? What are those mechanisms? The book is about those mechanisms. What are the mechanisms to overcome, overpower, find that victory, find your reinvented new way forward and align yourself with the next best steps in your calling journey. That wow. is the point. You do not stop at this victimhood. And furthermore, Casting external blame on others or, you know, fate mm. or whatever it is, yep. is never really helpful, even yep. when it's true. You know, I go through an example in the book of, um, of Michael Fagan, who was, you know, classically the, 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 the house painter uh, in, in, uh, in the UK uh, in the 80s, who ended up breaking, breaking into uh, uh, Buckingham Palace and uh, lighting up a cigarette in the Queen's bedroom. He, he got through all the security and you know, load up, light up a cigarette there and wanted to give her all his political grievances for him being out of work, uh, for his wife has leave, leaving him, for him not having access to see his children as a result of, the, result of the divorce, for him losing his confidence. And it was like this, it was victimhood. Wow. This is all because of you, the queen, or this is all because of Maggie Thatcher, whatever it is. And politics aside, doesn't matter. The point is, even when it's true, looking at an external macro source, be it politics or other people that you want to blame, it doesn't matter. You have to find your way forward. It is it is about your way. It's about you moving forward. And um, so, you know, I write about that in the book. Pointing at external or macro sources is not immediately useful or helpful. You have to take ownership of your own response to the circumstances you find yourself in, knowing that life's not fair. Right. Um, and um, and in a weird that's where the way, victory is found. Yes. That's when failure rules. That's you know, when failure will. That's exactly right. Listen, uh, you know, Dr. Stephen Covey, who wrote the book, Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, a lot of people misunderstand what his first habit was, which is to be proactive. But if you start to read into it or listen to what he talks about, uh, you know, the late Stephen Covey, you know, he talks about proactivity. He, you know, habit one is to be proactive. What he really means is take complete ownership and control of that's your right. life. That yeah. even to your point, Andrew, that you're saying that, you know, p people can do a lot of stuff to you and, and yeah, and turn turn you into a victim. I mean, victimhood, you know, sure. being a victim is a real thing. There are people who really are victims and 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 by no means would okay. I minimize that idea. We're still back to this thing that, OK, so this happened. I, I might have had 
absolutely nothing to do with this horrible trauma I just went through, but now I still have to own it, don't I? Yeah, you do. And it doesn't mean that you're not gonna have the residual ups and downs and effects right. of dealing with it, but it's a matter of choosing to commit to dealing with it, even if it continues to resurface. But it's 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 the retreat from wanting yes. to deal with it, and it's the embracing of lifting it up as a virtue in and of itself, which is the issue. And what you ought to do really is to say, this happened. This is something I may struggle with for the rest of my life. I know lots of people in my life, that's right. Uh, even some family members struggle with addiction, and it's that's the right. same thing. This is real. This is traumatic. This is seriously difficult, and. You know, the struggle is to not wallow in that identity, but the struggle against that identity, even if it's forever. Um, and and it, it's it's the it's that embracing and invoking that tension on purpose. That's right. Within and yourself. That's exactly right. And so and if you never get to the point of owning again, irrespective of the fact that you may not have caused it, as long as somebody else sure. owns it, you can't control it. Right. You can't right. really do anything about it. So let me ask you this. Now, you must have struggled about and, and I'm going to ask you to go through either, each of the chapter, each of the rules, if you will. Uh, but you must have struggled about number five, whether that should be number one or number five. Did you? <laughs> I mean, because, you know, you just keep thinking, well, yeah. that could be a good number one as well. That the first rule is to, you know, you are not you are not your failures. It's because it's a very important point. I think you did put it and ultimately put it in the right place. But. Every time I listen to you think, I say, well, yeah, you're not your failures. You know, you're not, you're, you yeah. don't identify yourself. Let me throw a couple of things out to you. And then I'm going to ask you, if you will, to go through each of each of the, the rules and, and, and give these tools to to our listeners. So but there's a couple of things that really caught my my eyes. One was it you, you said in your book, um, I believe this might have been in the introduction. It said I graduated from the University of the Streets, New York City. There was a lot of failure in that curriculum those failures enforce their rules the hard way. Well, I'll have to correct you there. That's, that's yeah. from that's from the forward, so that's actually not me. I mean the forward, That was bad. John yes. Joseph, okay. uh, who uh, singer of a legendary punk band, the Cro-Mags. Uh, he's a Hare Krishna devotee, written you know, five or six books. Um, wow. He's a triathlete, he's just amazing guy, one of my, my virtual mentors and heroes. So Say that's actually name, part okay. of his story. Say his name. John Joseph. Yes, thank John you. Joseph. I appreciate you correcting me on that. Yes. Yeah, he wrote the the PMA effect, which is positive mental attitude. Yeah. yeah. So, but the the but um you know so so yes, and then the other thing that you that really uh, resonated with me is when you you said to learn to be a failure prepper. Please, please tell us about that. Yeah. So again, it goes back to this premeditative approach, right? Yeah. Don't reactively wait till it happens and try to figure out how you're going to. Uh, you know, contend with it. Think ahead of time, prepare for it, anticipate it, decide ahead of time how you want to metabolize it, and decide that you're going to uh, kind of rise to your level of preparedness instead of just, uh, you know, um, you know, react to a failure event so that you can maximize and optimize it, leverage it, and get something out of it, you know? <laughs> I think of uh, Jack Nicholson playing Whitey Bulger in uh, the movie The Departed, where mm -hmm. you know he says, "I'm an artist. You give me anything, I'll get something <laughs> out of it." And that's the way we got to treat failure: is uh, thinking ahead of time, like when things don't work out. I mean, there's a, the old saying of "things work out the best for those that make the best of how things work out," and I think that really kind of sums it up. Man, I love this. You know, and what you're saying here makes me go back to parenting. And that I think this is a tremendous, you know, a tremendous, may, maybe this is another book for you there, Andrew, honestly, that, that, uh, and you know, my wife and I, you know, we raised two daughters and, um, and, uh, and we had to work on letting them fail. You see, it, it, it's, it's hard not to, I mean, yeah. listen, any parent knows yeah. this, you know, but it's, but when you talk about becoming a failure prepper, the, it, it should start with your parents, shouldn't it? So, so, I mean, you know, yeah. th this is almost like a, a, a big encouragement to the parents listening to this who are still raising their kids about the importance of thinking about preparing your kids in a controlled environment to fail. So that yeah, because so I controlled imagine, environment's key. I've yeah, actually yeah. known a couple of people who were so highly coddled uh, mm -hmm. growing up. I mean, just so incredibly coddled. Uh, one one person ended up a homeless and killing himself, and I'm personally convinced, Andrew, that.
that it was because he had no idea how to fail and do things for himself. And, and failure because at a smacked certain point, so hard. The, the world will force itself upon someone, right? You can yeah. only be sheltered for so long. You can only That's be right. kind of, uh, you know, inoculated from the, the hardness of life or the complexity of life for so yeah. long before it breaks through. And so it's a matter of deciding that you care more about somebody's character than their comfort. Gosh, and man, to break through good. the comfort, you have to allow, you know, reasonable failures to, to, to puncture that, that kind of force field and let them interact with them. Let them fall. You know, it's the old Batman thing. Bruce, why do we fall down so we can get back up? I mean, that is one of the key skills. The earliest, the earlier you can learn that or teach that or allow that for your children, um, the better off they're going to be. Um, and I think you're right. I think a lot of this, the younger generation, uh, I think particularly men or, or young or boys and, and young men um, are, are very handicapped uh, from, from um, you know, from scenarios where they've been way too coddled and haven't been allowed, you know, allowed to kind of roam free as much as they should. I, I see this sometimes up and up, uh, up front and personal. I think I mentioned to you when we talked before that I, you know, I coach a middle school tennis team. You know, these are 11, 11 to 13 year olds. And, uh, you know, to, it, my thought sometimes about that is, you know, d just depending on, on, on the child, but I would say for the vast majority of them who are either just learning to play or really don't have enough experience that, you know, I, I try to convince them to forget about winning, you know, forget about all of that. It, it's, you know, learn, you know, learn, learn how to win. And how do you learn how to win? by learning how to fail as well, because right. I've approached these young players uh, many times uh, over. In fact, we just had our, our final match last night and and sometimes you walk up to them and they're getting just crushed, you know, in a match and they're in complete tears. And I have to admit, part of what's in my head is is asking, why is this crushing this young kid so much? You know, I mean, and, and I, I don't, I, I'm not minimizing, I'm not suggesting that maybe they, they shouldn't be uh, broken, I guess you you can say about that. But then, but then we still come back to the question. And of course, I get to this place. You know, I, my ultimate question is, okay, you're getting crushed here. Let's let's just own that. <laughs> you know, sure. Uh, I was probably speaking a little bit more forthright to you about it. But but I I certainly ask. Okay, so what are we going to do here? You know, what you you do? We just stop right here, or you still got two games at least? You know, what what do we do? You know, and and try to get them thinking. You know, thinking. Mm -hmm. uh, and I've seen many of them come back. From just you know you know can, okay so you're not as good as the other player can you outsmart them, you know, and and yeah. so I mean I just I just think that it's 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 just uh, an incredibly important idea that um, that I I wish I'd have known more about as a dad and and encourage other parents to really think about helping their children learn how to fail. You know, and maybe yeah. this book is the first place to start, you know, get a copy of this book. Maybe, maybe. who knows, maybe it'll turn into a children's book at some point. You know, I mean, <laughs> I, I think I think it's, it's it, it, it could be, I mean, it's a great book and I really do recommend it, you know, but uh, boy, what a great uh, thing to do for, for parents out there to help them. You know, you're, you're, you're the sage, you're the, you're the person who's been through it and you, and you, and you put it in, you know, in a book form. And so you yeah. have all of this up there. So let me just ask you about the rules and, and maybe just offer some ideas or uh, some tips or whatever you think is most appropriate for this audience. I want them to walk away understanding this. And let's start with rule number one, failure purifies, which I, I do find uh, fast. I think I get it, but I'm going to let you go with it. Failure yeah, so it, it's, the, it's the idea that, that stems from the image of the phoenix, you know, burning from the ashes and arising in the flames. And it's the idea that... Um, um, you know, old thinking has to die for new thinking to rise, that the old you has to die for the new you to, ri new you to rise. I mean, it's very much rooted in, uh, you know, the idea of the resurrection, right? I mean, it's, it, it, wow. it, it's metaphorical in that sense and that we're continually dying to something and we're continually being reborn into something. And when we stop that process, whether we breathe or not, we are already dead. So in order to live, you must, must be constantly dying of something to and being born of something else. So failure is part of that crucible. It's part of that that anvil of change. And so you go yeah. through something. You have to realize, okay, there's probably some 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 incidental slop that has come into my life, come into my thinking, come into my approach for this pursuit, come into my uh, approach to relationships that needed to be exposed. 
and burned off. And failure is the, the mechanism often for that. And it's up to us to understand that and say, great, this now is out of my life. It was painful. I didn't see it coming. Uh, I didn't want it. But what now can be reborn? What now can be born, really? Not even reborn, but be born so that I can manifest myself newly wow. and differently in a more full way uh, on, on the next step of my calling journey. And it's just seeing Man. yourself as that evolving, you know, uh, really uh, being a, a purification. Um, that's why it's failure purifies. Uh, that's, um, that's, because that's, that's what it is. Yeah, that's it's way it's it, that's incredible. I might ask then. So, you know, how does one uh, uh, I'm not sure how the question should should roll. The, how does one approach this rule? How does one allow this rule to play out in their life? What's the first thing? So, so either they're coming upon failure or they're experiencing failure. How do they actually allow this rule to start to play out? We could even call it a principle. You know, what do they what do they do to get to this place where this failure begins to purify? Is it just a mindset? Is it just? Is it is it? Uh, let me just own this failure and figure it out, or or what? What what do you say about that? on a practical level. Um, so I would say it goes back to, you know, that internal spirit voice idea that in those failure sp spaces, I believe that the clarity of your internal spirit voice is kicked up, that you're in a more vulnerable and delicate, oh, yes. sensitive and tender spot where you can hear that internal spirit voice with more clarity, <laughs> you know, absent the busyness of the path that you were on that you thought was the right path before you hit that rock to push you to a new stream. And you hear that voice, and let that guide you if you're following, following wow. it accurately into the next step. So, I mean, just to give an example from the book, um, late great spy novelist Vince Flynn, he passed away in 2013. He was 47 years old, died of cancer. But, you know, his journey to become a spy novelist was, was wrought with failure. Um, he was rejected by multiple pub publishers. He was uh, dyslexic, so didn't have an easy time at becoming a writer. He was disqualified from the Marines, which is what he thought his North Star dream was. And in those failures, he found his real path, which was, all right, in this messiness, what do I actually want to do? And it turned out what he was actually meant to do, the highest use of his talent stack, was to write these spy novels. He went on to write 14 best-selling novels, including American Assassin. It's a movie made out of it with uh, uh, Michael Keaton. Um, and so it's, I think it's seeing those failure spaces as an opportunity knowing that, okay, I'm being purified in some way. What is it? What's being burned off of me and why? What do I need to see yeah. now to refill that space that even if I don't fully understand it, will be better in the future. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's um, you know. I love what you're saying here. You know, maybe the, uh, the, the opposite or the thing not to do or the thing that would not allow failure to purify you might be the person with this giant ego never accepting this failure never admitting that it's failure you know and there, there's some nuances in there and then just never learning from it so they never accept it you know i mean what one could argue i mean there, there are people that argue hey you just just ignore failure and keep going you know I, I'm, I'm sure there are people that can do that and these heavily driven people that they're just hell sure. bent to do it but i'd say the average person uh, they hide from it. They just, or they just, they just get busy, you know, yeah. and, and, and don't ever address it. And so I think your point is, if I understand you correctly, is one is to, you know, I guess you could say, let, let the failure happen, you know, give yourself some space, let things space. calm so you can begin to hear this spirit voice That's so right. that you can hear the That's wisdom right. that comes out of it. That's right. So I, mean, that... I think you're touching a good point, right? Cause it's not about, it's not about always seeing failure as a impetus to redirect into something else. Yeah. And it's not always about seeing failure as simply refining you to move forward in the same pursuit better. Yeah. It can be either one and it's up to you to figure that out. It depends on the trajectory. And I think it also depends on your own interpretation, analysis, and sense of what your highest use in the world is and when the next best step is to manifest that. And that might be redirect to another pursuit because of a failure. It might be to press on in the same pursuit, but with better knowledge and wisdom and refining and become a better you in that pursuit. So it depends on, to me, it all comes back to mapping yourself to however you can interpret the best we can in our human human uh, uh, you know, uh, limitations who were who 
what what is our highest use of, of the talents and skills that God has given us and how they uniquely aggregate to to bring us into the world. It all comes back to that. So even the word success is defined in the book, not as worldly success, not as, uh, you know, money, although money, not against yeah. any of that. I, I, marrying money and meaning is beautiful. That's that's a high goal. But it's, it's about uh, marrying yourself with your highest use in the world according to your unique talent stack, yeah. right? And so I describe in the definition of terms that success paradoxically you can be in the midst of a catastrophic failure moment that molds you in such a way that in hindsight later on becomes one of the biggest success moments of your life so it's it's recognizing that paradox gosh that is so good man okay rule number two nothing is safe what's the what's the rule there what 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 does one practice in that rule so i i think i think a inappropriate fidelity to safety is one of the main um, mm. <laughs> roadblocks that people allow to keep them from joining with their calling journey uh, because they are used to being conditioned by our education system, often by uh, familial expectations, that you are looking for the path of least risk. You are yes. looking for the safe path. You want to make sure you get that good 401k, you get your health benefits covered. Uh, you know, you don't want to take too much risk and you want to make sure that you're on somebody else's payroll and not going out on your own. And you don't want to take out debt to start that business. You don't want to go down a creative artistic path because it's going to be more difficult to find a way to monetize it. So we're often taught to stay away from those paths because of safety. And I just think that is the wrong message. I wow. think it holds us back from being who we ought to be. I see, I believe that many people who take that safe path often are disintegrating. Uh, as Thoreau put it, they're living lives of quiet desperations because they're never doing anything to risk themselves to try to be great uh, or try to manifest their highest self. I think of the story of Johnny Cash, how he um, you know, was working as a salesman. You know, hello, I'm Johnny Cash uh, for his first wife, uh, Vivian Liberto's father, his, his, his previous you know, father-in-law. And that was a path of death. It may have been safe. He may have had a petty stay check at the end of the day. He may have been able to support his family. And frankly, he might have maybe been able to stay with his family. But I doubt it. I think those paths make us sick in some way, psychologically, even physical manifestations, our spirit dwindles. And so what did Johnny do? He married himself with the mysterious tumult of his calling journey and chased after the creative pulses inside and went after music that led him into tragedy addiction because he couldn't he couldn't handle uh, his fame all kinds of problems but then those problems also then wrought his redemptive story and made the power of his uh joining himself with uh, the vastness of god's forgiveness even with carrying the complexity of his own imperfection and sin that story then made his his life and his legacy what it was supposed to be to be a message to us and and wow. that was so I have a book on a, a chapter in the book on him called Get Used to Unsafe Spaces. And it's about yeah. the life of Johnny Cash. And so to me, you know, nothing is safe. Just that one phrase. I wrote 27 chapters of it on it. Um, tons of examples. I talk Dude. about um, I talk about Mike Rowe. He had a show, Dirty Jobs. And yeah. uh, I think the one episode was called Safety Third. Not that he thought you ought to put safety third yes. all the time arbitrarily, but just to say that uh, we shouldn't we shouldn't always have safety first, yeah. that yeah. there are competing higher values that we ought to consider in many circumstances. Sometimes safety is first, but many times there are things that are more valuable than safety. Um, oh, and um, Dude, so that so that's powerful. where failure number two, nothing is safe comes from, because I think that um, because when you go down the unsafe path, you will hit failures. You need to learn how to anticipate them, but you're also going into the spaces of highest meaning. You know, I, I mean, this is so powerful, and, and I think it's 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 appropriate to say that you know there are plenty of people out there, and I don't begrudge anybody who lives a very simple, let's just call it normal, stable uh, sure. life without risk. You know, they retire very quietly and 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 do things very quietly, and and all of that's good because if this brings them joy, I mean, all all of that's good, but. But then there's but then there's the other person who at the end of yeah. their life, they say, I wished I would have, you know, or what I really wanted to do was this. And, and but they played it safe. And I love that. So uh, money is spiritual is the third rule. Yeah. So just real quick on that point, 
you know, Please. this is not to judge those no. who you, you talk about because it's no. really a personal thing. Yeah. You know whether you're chasing what burns inside you that you ought to chase or not. There you go. And it's not for you or I to judge. That's correct. But for those who know that they have something burning inside them that they ought to chase and they don't because they're afraid of it being unsafe, that ultimately will eat them, eat, eat, eat them inside. You nailed and it. And they will have regrets, spoken or unspoken, yeah. uh, as, as they get closer to that's right. You know, and, and, and I, as a, as a Christ follower, would, would also, also say that, you know, that you, you may not be fulfilling the, 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 uh, the purpose that, you know, God wants you to have. Because I was also going to say that uh, some, sometimes, I, I don't know how often, but sometimes it, it, it has nothing to do with you. <laughs> you know, I mean, Johnny right. Cass's life may have, you know, you know he, he may just needed to, to go through that hell uh, for everybody else and has nothing to do with him. You know, it That's wasn't right. about him. I, I'm, I'm not saying right. it wasn't, but that, no, so, but you're right. You know, yeah. so uh, money is spiritual. So money is spiritual. I actually, you know, that phrase kind of hit me from um, a comment that Rabbi Daniel Lappin made. I mm. love his book, Thou Shalt Prosper, which yeah. was, was a great uh, book for me. Yeah. Um, just the idea that, yeah, money, money is spiritual. Money is it, it, the love of money is the root of all evil, but money is not the root of all evil. It's really uh, an indifferent tool and it depends on how you use it. Um, you could edge into the failure spaces of envy and greed. Uh, greed is, you know, obviously demonized by people as it ought. Uh, I think people, um, you know, under, understate how envy is equally as bad as greed. It's the malevolent twin sibling of greed. Uh, and so they're the failure territories on the edges. But if you use money correctly as a tool, it really is a thank you note. Uh, you're basically saying, I value your effort, the talent, the, 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 the amount of time you've put in to provide me this product or service and, um, you know, uh, measured thankfulness or, or, or you know, yep. Yeah. <laughs> How do I put, put this? So it's, it's a thank you note. It, it's a measure of gratitude. Yeah. It's, it's, you that's when it's used properly. A, yeah. You, you could even say it's, it's a fairly natural consequence you know, that uh, of, of hard work or of good work or, or whatever the case might be, you know, uh, very, very interesting. L let me keep moving here um, <clears throat> and ask you then about number four. It says, and two, let's see, and thing two, dependency, failure, prevention, mm, the thing one, and I, I might, I might have screwed yeah, that up when I put these yeah, in my yeah, notes. Yeah. Please, please clarify number four. Rule number Fair four. Rule number four is called the thing one and thing two dependency, and then in parentheses, it's Failure oh, I see. I, so, I, I just put it down. Yeah. On notes wrong. Yeah. So the thing one and thing two dependency thing one and thing two has nothing to do with cat in the hat. Uh, I actually, when I thought of it, I thought more of a, of, of a disheveled Tony Soprano in his white bathrobe lighting the first cigar of the day and saying, you know, you got the thing one over here and the thing two over there, you know? And so thing one is your enabler pursuit. It's usually a low meaning pursuit that is kind of the stabilizing undergirding that helps you then uh, pursue your North Star or thing two pursuit, which is the highest manifestation uh, uh, that you can conceive of, of, of your value to the world. Because that usually needs some belts and suspenders, some scaffolding to enable it over time. And so it's the dependency between your thing one enabler pursuit and your thing two North Star pursuit. And I go through a bunch of examples in the book. And one of the examples I go through uh, is, um, you know, there's uh, uh, a couple brothers I knew. They're anonymized in the book. Uh, they were uh, Lebanese from a, a Shia Muslim background. Uh, and um, they uh, wanted to seed some businesses. They didn't have the cash. So they worked for Disney on Ice for several years, where Disney on Ice oh, paid my. their lodging and all their food, so they had no expenses. They were able to save up cash for the seed money. That was their thing one enabler, a very creative, outside of the box thing one enabler that then seeded these businesses that they started everything from gas stations uh, to gyms to cigar lounges, and they built kind of a retail portfolio that ended up supporting for the rest of their lives. And so it's it's thinking through, you know the creativity of having to get to your North Star thing pursuit. And then also realizing that, that, that it contextualizes your narrative and your story. So when you do ring, reach that thing, thing to North Star pursuit, the story that got you there is almost just as valuable and full of lessons and wisdom mm. uh, uh, as the actual reaching of that thing, thing, uh, thing to North Star pursuit. Uh, and so that's really what that's all about. And it's, it's a mechanism to prevent failure because 
if you go straight for your North Star thing to pursue, I see no holds barred without any, you know, undergirding of support, um, you know, you, you're more susceptible to failure. So that's hard that's failure. About. Yeah. And a harder failure because you're going to have failure anyway. Right. Yes. But you, we want to prevent it. That's that's the uh, the, uh, the 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 truth of failure that uh, is kind of, um, you know, self-evident, which is still try not to fail as much as possible. That's the self-evident failure rule, right? Uh, and so this is this is more about a strategy for minimizing and mitigating failure. Yeah, man, that's okay. that's that's cool. And then the last one, you, you've already kind of talked about it, but but I'll mention one more thing about it. And rule number five is you are not your failures. And I, I mean, I just appreciate that so much. I do recall when I got out of the Air Force in 2000, after, you know, 20 years in the Air Force, um, you know, it uh, about a year after, you know, I struck what I thought was failure. You know, it was hard um, trying to figure out how to be an entrepreneur and, and have a business of my own and build it. And I had no concept of how to do this. And mm. um, so I, I'll spare the story again. But um, but essentially, I, I started seeing a therapist and I remember her drawing these pictures. Uh, she you know, she said. You, she said, you know, she, she drew this big circle and then she drew this other little circle over here, you know, and 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 I believe if she didn't use this word, it was it was right along the line. She said, Kevin, you know, here's 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 that failure. It's it's this, it's a little piece over here, though. It's not it's not you. That's right. You're not you're not your failure. This is a That's part right. of your life. And I and it really profoundly changed. It, it helped me go. Yeah, man. To your point, Andrew. I think, I think a lot of us, certainly I did, look at this and said, you know, the old I am phrase, I am a yeah. failure here. And what she said, Kevin, you know, I mean, however you want to look at this, but it's just a small part of who you are. That it's it's an existence. It's 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 an episode. Whatever you want to call it, it's not yeah, it's the whole bad. you. And so you know, close with a, a, a you know, just maybe another. You know, inspirational word to encourage people to really grapple with this idea that your failures are not who you are, or you are not your failures. Yeah, I think it's again it caps out the, the entire set of rules for me because that that's really the conclusion. You know, is um, detach from the optics of failure. So one of the examples I give in the book is is uh, the, the biography of Glenn Beck, the, the radio personality, and mm -hmm. uh, how prior to him becoming who he is today, he was uh, kind of, uh, he, was a, he was a DJ, like a music DJ. He was uh, you know, very obnoxious. He was Still, an yeah. alcoholic. <laughs> he uh, you know, dabbled in cocaine use uh, and he crashed and burned and he even became almost suicidal at one point where he was listening to the grunge band Nirvana and wanted to drive off a bridge. And so these are all stories that he's told. And it was at a certain point where he, he turned away and, uh, you know, he decided to, you know, after he was, you know, his family broke up and he's in a dingy apartment and he, he couldn't even afford Christmas presents for his kids. It was, he decided to detach from, from the, um, the view that he was his failures. And it was in that space where he was able to renew his spirituality find a good woman, start to rebuild his career in a different way. He switched from music to talk. And now he's become one of the most influential voices for, yeah. um, you know, uh, Judeo-Christian thought, libertarian ideology, and, um, you know, even self-improvement messaging, right? And so it's it, it, it all comes in, in the failure space of, of rejecting, attaching your identity to it, taking that open space and finding out who you're supposed to be next to find the, the true wow. next version of your identity that will join you with that calling journey uh, in, in a succinct way. Uh, but you have to detach from uh, your identity being pegged to failure. And then you have to look at that open space and figure out what you're wow. going to get out of that. And by the way, it's never too late, is it? No, of course not. We're you constantly know, I mean, being people renewed. People get to finish We're a career and they say, yeah, I just, you know, I, I recall, uh, a few years ago, you know, speaking, he was he was a chairman. You know, he was, he was a client. He was a chairman CEO of a of a big firm, and uh, and I was congratulating him on how successful he was. And he says, "Yeah, you know, but uh, yeah, but you know, uh, okay, but my uh, you know my wife and kids have no idea who I am, you know." And mm. and and he he d tremendous success mm. 
but he mm. he really looked at all of that success as as failure well he wasn't sure. dead yet you know and and i remember yeah. my my thought was to him you know it's it's not too late to to uh, to not. make that happen either you know to, that's to right that so Listen, Andrew, um, would you please share with our audience, you know, m maybe it's obvious, and but uh, where they can find you, where they can find your book. Again, I want to, you know, I'd love for you to put your book up into the into the camera there. And again, I'm going to read it. It says, Failure Rules, the Five Rules of Failure for Entrepreneurs, Creatives, and Authentics. So that means that if you're not an entrepreneur or a creative, you are probably an authentic. So it's this That's book right. for everybody. Or an aspiring or authentic, a, or aspiring authentic. authentic we all right. are, yeah, yeah. So the book is still for everyone, even though there are special groups that might uh, resonate with it more. But it is for everyone. I mean, failure is for everybody to, to learn about. You can find it at andrewthorpeking.com. T H O R P, no e on the end. All my stuff is there. It's obviously on Amazon. Anywhere books are sold online, all formats, including audio book. Um, also on my website, sign up for the email newsletter. You'll get a free mini course. Failure nice. mini course. With that sign up, chance to win some some swag from uh, from, the, from the book and also my clothing company, Soul and Fire Supply Company. Got the merch. Um, so that's where you can find it. And plus my YouTube channel at Andrew Thorpe King on the YouTube channel. Some great produced videos to to see the themes of the book come alive in a different way. Oh man, I love that. So AndrewThorpeKing.com. Again, no e on Thorpe and. I, if they go there, they can pretty much get directed wherever they, they want to go, right? Yes. Well, That's listen, right. Andrew, it has been a complete pleasure. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm, you know, even though we we've talked before, I, I'm still blown away by your your wisdom and just your thinking on all of this. It's really got such breadth and depth, and uh, I am sure that that the audience that I have is 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 gonna is loving this and gonna love it more. And I just appreciate you so much taking the time to be uh, with us here on Grow Yourself. Well, thank you. I appreciate you uh, taking the time as well. And just remember, after it sucks, failure rules. <laughs> Thanks so much. God bless you on that. <laughs>